I am joined today by Professor Erwin Kotler of the Raoul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights, Michael Levitt, the CEO of FSWC, and of course, Max Eisen. There was never any doubt that these men would be able to draw a crowd, but we were astounded with the amount of interest that we received from individuals across the nation, as well as some even beyond our own borders. We are so excited to have you all here today to take part in this critical conversation. We are pleased to have partnered with the Raoul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights to present the Survivor Speaker Series. It is my absolute pleasure to ask <laughs> Professor Erwin Kotler to offer some opening remarks. Professor Kotler is the chair of the Raoul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights, a professor of law at McGill University, former Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada, and longtime member of parliament, and of course, an international human rights lawyer. Please give a warm virtual welcome to Professor Kotler. Thank you, Emily. Thank you for those kind words. And I'm delighted to participate in this uh, joint venture partnership with the Canadian friends of Simon Wiedenthal, now headed by uh, Michael Levitt, a great parliamentarian with whom I had the privilege and pleasure of working uh, with him. And all I can say is that Parliament's loss is Simon Wiesenthal's gain. And I also want to commend uh, the great team, Emily, that all of you have uh, at the Simon Wiesenthal Center and have put this together today. Both our organizations, as it happens, are named in memory of and in tribute to two heroes of the Holocaust and humanity. Rao Wallenberg, Canada's first honorary citizen, demonstrated how one person with the capacity to care and the courage to act can confront evil and transform history. From mid-May to the beginning of July 1944, 140,000 140, Hungarian Jews were deported to the Auschwitz death camp the cruelest, most efficient, fastest killing field in all of the Holocaust. Max Eisen, our speaker today, was one of those who witnessed, as a Holocaust survivor from Auschwitz, who witnessed horrors too terrible to be believed, but not too terrible to have happened. Raoul Wallenberg arrived at the Swedish delegation in Budapest in mid-July 1944, and through ingenuity, bravado, and the like, managed to save, along with others whom we mobilized, the remnant of 100,000 Hungarian Jews. So what the bystander international community could not do, one person demonstrated how one can confront evil and, as I said, transform history. And the same with Simon Wiesenthal. Simon Wiesenthal transformed the whole universe with respect to bringing justice for the victims, accountability for the violators, and principally involved in the bringing of Nazi war criminals to justice. I met with Simon Wiesenthal again and again, but always only in Austria or at some port of call in Europe, because Simon Wiesenthal wouldn't meet with me in Canada, because he felt that Canada was an example not of bringing Nazi war criminals to justice, but of the failure in bringing Nazi war criminals to justice. And one interesting intersection in the Wallenberg and uh, Wiesenthal cases, Simon Wiesenthal sponsored in 1981 a major international hearing into the fate and whereabouts of the disappeared hero, uh, Raoul uh, Wallenberg. So you have the intersection of these two great heroes. You have now the intersection of our two organizations named in their remembrance. And I'm delighted to be part of this joint initiative and look forward to continuing to work together in common cause. So thank you so much, Professor. We appreciate you joining us this afternoon to take part in what is sure to be a memorable presentation. Max Eisen has been a Holocaust educator for the past 30 years, sharing his testimony with many thousands of students, teachers, police officers, politicians, and lifelong learners across the nation and beyond. His story of survival was chronicled in his best-selling memoir, By Chance Alone, which won Canada Reads 2019. I've had the pleasure of working alongside Max these past few years, and I'm delighted to introduce him to you all here tonight. Max, take it away. Thank you. Um, I hope there is a rattle here behind me. The, one of the, the disadvantages living in a condo, somebody is doing repairs and we have to put up with this drill sound. So uh, forgive me for that. So uh, November, uh, November the 9th, uh, coming up next week, Kristallnacht 
is one of the important dates um, in Jewish history when the Nazis threw down the gauntlet against the Jewish community. Over a thousand, about 1400 synagogues were burned to the ground. They said it was a spontaneous act. Uh, that was not true because all the fire departments were called out to be on, on the spot near the burning synagogues, not to put the flames out of the synagogues, but to make sure that the neighboring buildings will not catch fire. So we know the Nazi era started in 1933. Um, Hitler entered the Reichstag. And by 1935, they came out with a racial loss against the Jews. They had a uh, minister of propaganda, a uh, powerful machine headed by Dr. Goebbels. He had a um, microphone. He called this an amazing instrument where he was getting out this hatred. Jews were being demonized, dehumanized on a daily basis with a hate sheet. So a government that has a powerful propaganda machine, a ministry, and the apparatus of deception. It started with words, and uh, it led to uh, terrible places eventually. So um, once you put these terrible words out, you can never take it back. So the racial laws that were brought out on, practically on a daily basis uh, in Nazi Germany, um, Jews were systematically removed from their everyday life. Jews were fired from jobs. Jewish teachers couldn't teach non-Jewish students. Jewish kids could not go to uh, public schools. Jews could only sit on a park bench that was marked for Jews only. They could only shop in stores that after seven o'clock in the evening, and by that time, most of the goods were gone. So the boycotts were started out with the Hitler's brown shirts. They came and stood in front of Jewish stores, and they either painted the slogan on the plate glass window, Kauf nicht von Juden, do not buy from Jews. So uh, I keep thinking of today, our things seem to repeat themselves. And we have a movement today in North America and Canada as everywhere else. It's called Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions. So it started with boycotts. <clears throat> Jews were removed from everyday life. Their livelihood was taken away, businesses, factories, and so on. And uh, divested from their financial properties, their bank accounts, and so on. And then they were put onto trains and shipped out. Now, the deception of these three words of boycott, boycott actually means excommunication. Divestment means expulsion. Sanctions means extermination. So, and I keep thinking of this every day when I hear BDS movements right here in Canada. It's for people to understand where, what a terrible thing this is. Uh, so, I lived in Czechoslovakia, in a wonderful country. We Jews had 20 golden years in Czechoslovakia, in a town of about 5,000 people. There were 90 Jewish families. Uh, we were sort of middle class family. My father had a uh, distillery and a uh, drinking place, it was called a cellar. My grandfather had a lumber yard. Jews have lived in that part of Czechoslovakia for generations, for 1,900 years. So in 1938, this our beautiful life in Czechoslovakia suddenly ended through the Munich conference. When Hitler demanded part of my country, the Sudeten part, and um, the Prime Minister of Britain and uh, of France, they were called to this important meeting, and the Czech president was not asked to come to this meeting. 
They handed over part of my part of Czechoslovakia on a platter to Hitler. They received a document that wasn't where the paper it was written on. If you recall the statement of Chamberlain when he arrived in uh, London, got off his airplane and he said, peace in our time. And he wrote in his diary, we wouldn't go to war for a country whose name we cannot even pronounce. The French prime minister, the headlines in the papers were no war. This was 1938. We Jews, we were knew that we were in mortal danger. Months later, Nazi troops marched into uh, Prague and the country was partitioned into three parts. So where I live, we live in the Eastern part of Czechoslovakia, we became Hungarians. Hungarians were a fascist country allied with Nazi Germany. And it was a big change for us. We spoke the language because we were ethnic Jews, ethnic Hungarian Jews who have lived there under the Austro-Hungarian monarchy. So uh, these racial laws were posted in my town. My father's business was confiscated. The Jews couldn't, they had to take the bicycles and radios. There were two radios. The Jewish families owned, my father had one. And we had a bicycle as well. We had to take it down to town hall. So step by step, systematically, they took things away. Our freedom of movement was taken away from us. Every Jewish family had to be photographed. And the law came out that all able-bodied Jewish men had to report to labor battalions from 18 to 45 years old. So out of the 90 Jewish families, I would say 99% of the breadwinners were all gone for years. That included my father and my uncle. And the law came out that Jews cannot uh, have a, anybody helping them who is uh, a non-Jew. And my mother had a helper whose name was Anna. She came to live with us when I was uh, born in 1929. I will never forget, she was my mother's right-hand person. She didn't want to leave because she was like part of the family. The gendarmes came and refused her, uh, removed her bodily from our home. And, um, and then we had to wear a yellow star. Imagine Jewish kids were less than 10% of the student body. We arrived that particular morning when we all had our yellow stars on and there was a big fight. How uh, things changed, how uh, the uh, local people with whom we have lived with for generations, done business with, helped each other, how uh, things have changed. Uh, we had a fight, a battle every day, nonstop. Uh, Hungarian teachers who were terrible Jew haters, they made us sit in the back of the classroom. We were segregated in the school. And I was 12 and a half and uh, we were thrown out of school. So from there on, my, uh, I went to the school of Hard Knocks. My mother took me to the capital city of our province. Uh, it was called in Hungarian Kasha. In Slovak, it's called Kosice. I became an apprentice. And um, I did that for about two and a half years. And my father uh, was gone from 1940, end of 1941 till 1944 in a labor battalion. He was allowed to come home once in a blue moon. And so grandfather was the head of the family. My grandfather was a very strong man and he was truly my role model. He was a non-commissioned officer in the, the Austro-Hungarian cavalry in the First World War. And uh, he taught me a lot of skills he always told me that no matter what I'm going to do, it has to be, I had to be at 100%. So my mother, who was uh, truly my guardian angel, my grandmother, and the entire extended family, I had an extended family, both from my paternal side and my maternal side. So uh, in 1942, when this partition happened, my maternal family were stuck in Slovakia, in the, autonomous country of Slovakia. They were the largest part of my family. One day a telegram arrived. Somebody sent us a telegram that the Friedman family were taken away. It was a total shock. My mother was devastated that her mother, and her uh, brothers, sisters, nieces, nephews, and my uncles, everybody was gone. And nobody knew what happened to them. This was in 1942. 
And you know, by 1942, when you're looking at this map of continental Europe, Nazi Germany occupied every one of these countries. Some of them were collaborating with the Nazis. And we didn't know in 1942 what was going on just across the Carpathian Mountains in occupied Poland. And you know, not knowing is a terrible thing. And I keep thinking today when we know or what is going on and we still can't make a movement to do something. So uh, this was 1942, a few months later, a postcard arrived with a German eagle on it. And the stamp said Lublin district. And the message was, we the Friedman family, we are all here together. We are working on farms and we are awaiting your arrival. This arrived about three or four months after this telegram. I only found out about a couple of years after I was liberated what this meant. Several families in my town received similar postcards. This was part of the Nazis' deception because my family of the Friedman family, they were deported to Majdanek. Before they were put into the gas chamber, they were forced to write these, post these postcards to their families in Hungary. This is how they were planning already the Hungarian deportation in 1942. So in 1943, my Aunt Bella died, who was an invalid, and that was quite a shock. She was a uh, invalid and she taught me how to read. Uh, a casket was made uh, from my grandfather's lumber yard and she was buried in the cemetery. The only one person that uh, was buried in a cemetery, the rest of the family, um, their ashes were blown to the four corners of the world. And my mother gave birth to a little girl, and that was not a good year for a Jewish mother and a Jewish child to be born. 1944, we were celebrating Passover. And um, it is a big do to prepare for Passover. The whole house is turned upside down. Every piece of, every little crumb of bread has to be found and removed. And my mother always made special dishes. And we always had the Seder, the order of the dinner, together the three families who lived in this big house. My paternal grandparents and my uncle and aunt, they had no children, and my, my parents and my siblings. And by some miracle, my father and uncle were home from their labor battalions. And um, we sat down to the Seder to tell the story of the Exodus. I can see this table set beautifully with a candle sticks burning and uh, smell of wonderful food. And we told the story of the Exodus. My younger brother, Eugene and uh, Alfred asked the four questions. Why is this night different than any other night? My baby sister was there in the crib. And we told the story of the Exodus. Little did we know that this was the last time that my family would be sitting together, never again to repeat a Seder, a dinner in our home. We retired about 12 o'clock and my father and my uncle and my uh, grandfather, we were out in the yard, it was a balmy night. My guardian dog, a big Alsatian, he was roaming all over the place, he was our guardian. And my grandfather was saying uh, that if we manage to hold on another four to five months, they're going to be liberated by the uh, Red Army. See, my grandfather sort of was able to read in between the lines. We were that close and then a tsunami came early morning. Our gate was kicked in by gendarmes two minutes later. They kicked in our bedroom door and two gendarmes are in your bedroom and they're yelling and screaming that you have two minutes to pack a bundle. We are taking you away. And I remember I had a very large stamp collection and uh, of course, my mother said, the only thing you can take, you need to put on layers of clothing. And she was holding a baby in her arm. My father told me to put on my boots and he went into the quarters of my grandparents. My grandfather was 77 years old. My grandmother was 75. My father was 42. My mother was 40. And with two gendarmes who moved us to the school in our town. 500 Jews were assembled in the school that night. It was a terrible night. 
And um, a year later when I managed to survive and came back, I was told by a lady who was a neighbor, uh, her name was Illy Klinka. And I just want to backtrack a second. Why are these gendarmes are in our home? There's a terrible pandemonium. Who's going to take what? This lady, Illy Klinka, Klinka, a Christian lady came into our quarters and the gendarmes were yelling at her, get out of here, this is not your business. And she said to my mother, Ethel, where are you taking this baby? Why don't you leave the baby with me? And I think about that, you know, uh, a mother is asked to give up her child. And I keep thinking, had my mother left the baby with Illy Klinka, perhaps she would have survived, we'll never know. So the next, so the night when we were sealed off from the town, Every Jewish home was ransacked to the bare walls and the synagogue, the uh, prayer books and the Talmudic books were burnt in a pyre. The Torah scrolls were taken out of the ark and cut into ribbons and worse. And you know, in my town, there were, I would say 80% of the town's population are Roman Catholic or Eastern Orthodox and Protestant and 10% were Jews. There was a Roman Catholic church, a Protestant church and the synagogue. Next morning, 500 Jews were assembled in the schoolyard, and this was our exodus. Leaving town, can you imagine 500 Jews loaded with their bundles? The mothers were not allowed to have their carriages. And I can see my mother carrying a baby in one arm, a bundle of clothing in her other arm, and taking some utensils in a sheet on her back. 1944, we did not know. We arrived, we were taken to a brickyard in Kasha, 30,000 Jews were assembled there. And uh, we were brainwashed by an SS officer who came to our brickyard. And he told us that you're going to be resettled in the East. Families will be together. They'll, you'll be working on farms. And they repeated the same lie. You see, it was a time when the lies became the truth. And he repeated the same lie, and I kept thinking of the postcard that we received two years before. And I kept thinking that I'll meet up with my two gorgeous cousins, these two girls. We, we were always a trio when I saw them every summer holiday. We were put into a kettle car, 100 people stuffed in. It was a terrible journey. We couldn't move around. I couldn't see my mother or my two little brothers. They were stuck between taller people. And I just keep thinking how my mother was stuck in a corner and other mothers holding babies in their arms. No water for four days. Initially, they gave us a pail of water and the pail for the toilet. It was terrible stench. The slop was just under our feet all over the place. Two people died, two older people. And um, on the fourth night, train came to a stop. I knew that they had finally arrived. I thought that nothing could be worse than what I've just experienced. We were, the doors were open. It was, uh, everything was floodlit. It was called a rampa. They, uh, <clears throat> they were SS units there and they had a skull, skull and crossbow on their helmets or on their caps. This was a unit that were called a totem cup division of the SS. I guess they were in charge of hauling the Jews from every point in continent Europe to the death camps in occupied Poland. And they told us on this uh, platform that mothers with children and older people go to the left for disinfection. And uh, there was a other officer picking people and my father and uncle and I we were selected for slave labor. We did not understand what this was all about. And we were taken to a sauna where our clothes were taken away, our hair was cut. We were put through a shower and into a bunk, a triple tier bunk in a wooden barrack. Women were processed in the women's camp the same way. And um, we were woken up the next morning. We arrived there May the 8th, 1944. We were woken up. About six o'clock in the morning, or hauled up in front of the camp. And this was the first sight that I had of Birkenau Auschwitz. Hundreds of barracks, and there were four huge chimneys 
belching smoke and flames, and we were naked. I thought it was a big industrial zone, although I could see barbed wire fences and emaciated people in striped clothing. I kept wondering, what am I doing here between all these criminals who are wearing striped, striped clothes? I remember two men in striped clothes brought a canister of uh, liquid, a little bit of tea, and we were given a chisel, a metal dish. My father asked them, are we going to see our families today? And they said, where did you come from? So my father said, we just came from Hungary in the middle of the night. And I, I can hear it so clearly. They said, in 1944, you don't know what this place is all about. He said, your families have gone through the chimney. This was the lingo here. So this is the entrance to the death camp of Birkenau. And you see, for the Hungarian Jews, this was the main track. For Hungarian Jews, they put on two extra tracks. So in less than three months, 450,000 Hungarian Jews were delivered here and murdered. Um, so I know, I knew by the next day that my mother was taken into a gas chamber with probably 2,000 people where they were murdered by Zyklon B. Gas, a collective death, you know, of 2,000 people. It is something that I will never get over. And uh, while SS officers were watching the agonies of these people dying through reinforced peoples, we were given striped outfits and tattooed numbers marched down to Auschwitz I. So we became uh, slave laborers working for the Reich. So the life of a slave laborer is, um, is uh, a terrible thing. You're living on a 300 calorie diet, a cup of tea in the morning, your lunch is half an hour and you get a ladle of uh, stinking soup. There's everything in it that you cannot imagine. And then you walk back to camp at night after a 10 or 12 hour hard labor day. And you receive your dinner, which is a cup of Erza's coffee, a thin slice of bread and a little spur of margarine. And you know, your body is going haywire and you have to deal with all these things. Um, your hands are uh, blisters from holding tools and working day after day. And you have to figure out how you're going to handle every little thing every in detail the next day. I was very fortunate that my father and uncle were with me for two months. They were truly my guardian angels. And uh, <clears throat> They were selected out in July of 1944. There were a lot of selections that started because the Red Army was coming from the east. Um, they were packing up their the, the factories, were packing up their equipment, sending it back to the fatherland. There was no more need for workers. So I remember on that night in July, my father and uncle, they were separated from me and they were in a different barrack. And, uh, you're woken up, you hear the loudspeakers are turned on, they're very powerful loudspeakers. And it said, Achtung, Achtung. All inmates from these barracks go naked right away to this building, this is an Auschwitz one, for selection. And that time we already knew, I knew what selection was, there was certain death. And my father and uncle were selected out because the next morning I ran to their barrack and they were not there. I had to line up to be counted every morning. You know, counting, it was called appel. You know, this counting morning and night, can you imagine counting 30,000 people in the morning? Nothing moves out of the camp to the works, to the jobs, until the count is right. If they find somebody who died during the night, the body had to be brought down. So in a good day, the counting was about an hour and a half, two. On a bad day, you could be standing there for three to four hours. People simply dropped dead. And this was morning and night. And I ran to, the, uh, to their barrack and they were not there. And there was a quarantine area inside of Auschwitz. One, a few barracks were fenced off where they were holding people who were going to be taken to the gas chambers or whatever. And I happened to see my father and uncle and we only had seconds to say goodbye. My father gave me a blessing and he told me that if I managed to survive, I have to tell the world what happened here. I was devastated and he told me go because the guard was yelling from the tower that if I don't move, I'll be shot. And um, 
I was really alone after that. It was a terrible feeling. And I had a beating by an SS guard who hit me on the back of my head with the butt of his rifle. I lost a lot of blood. I had to be carried back to Auschwitz one at night in the evening. And I was dumped into the, in the surgery department, uh, barrack 21. There were two Polish political prisoners who were the surgeons. They operated on me. And I woke up the next morning and uh, I was in the ward and uh, I didn't know what happened to me. And uh, uh, there were two Jewish doctors who were tending after the patients who were operated on. One was a Dr. Gordon from Warsaw, and there was a Dr. Samuel Steinberg from Paris. And they told me who the, who the surgeon was who came to look at the patients. And after two days, if you couldn't walk away from the hospital, you were put on a stretcher and taken to the gas chamber. As they were taking me on the stretcher, Dr. Rzeszko took me off the stretcher, brought me into the prep room of the surgery, and he gave me a lab coat and I became the cleaner. And uh, he saved my life and I worked for him for six months. From July to January the 15th, 1945. That's say he saved my life. This is Dr. Rzeszko. And uh, you know, there were terrible doctors who did terrible things in Auschwitz, even though they saw the Hippocratic Oath. Well, I know Dr. Rzeszko and his assistant. They put people together who were in such terrible shape, broken bones. And they knew that two days later they'll be taken away. And no matter what, how, you know, what happened, they had to, they did the best they could to put these people together, even if it was two days. So this is a surgery. Now you might ask, why did they have a surgery? This was part of the Nazi deception. I know that they brought the International Red Cross here. I remember we had a <clears throat> Ernest Sundel, a German guy who lived here in Toronto. Uh, he was a revisionist and he went to Auschwitz one and he said, oh, I was there. They had a surgery. They took good care of the people. It was an R&R &R place and they even had a swimming pool. Well, I took care of this. I was 15 and a half years old and my work was from seven o'clock in the morning till 12 o'clock at night. Can you imagine we're doing operations every day anywhere from five to 10 operations depending on and sometimes uh, in the middle of the night but I did this and you can see the floors were shining. This was all the training that my grandfather uh, helped me with. You know, here you have to be very focused. Uh, you have to be very resilient. But working inside was really a uh, salvation because I couldn't have survived the winter. So uh, on January the uh, 15th, uh, we were taken out on a death march. <clears throat> Auschwitz was liberated on January the 27th by the Soviet troops. The death march took about uh, 15 days. I arrived on, um, left on the 15th, arrived in Mauthausen, Austria on the 23rd. Uh, I would say that 60% of the people that left were all, they died on this journey. Uh, we walked in terrible cold and without any food, and uh, we were black from frostbite. It was a terrible, terrible um, march. And I, I look at these arrows in camps in Austria and arrows in uh, camps in Germany. You might ask, why did these SS units move tens of thousands of Jews? The Red Army was barely, I don't know, maybe 50, 100 kilometers behind us. But you know, I, my theory is that they simply walked themselves back to their homes in Austria and Germany. They said, well, the Jews is our business, you know. Otherwise, I guess they would have had to go and fight on the Eastern, for, on the Eastern Front against the uh, Red Army. So um, I was um, a witness. Uh, in 2017 or 15 and 16, I guess, of two SS guards who were doing duty in um, Birkenau. One was Oscar Dröning. There's a book about him, The Bookkeeper of Auschwitz, and there's a documentary it's called The Accountant of Auschwitz. 
And um, I'm sitting in a court in Lunenburg, a German court, and um, I can see this SS man and I looked at him, he's an old man with a walker and I, rem I didn't, I wouldn't remember him. I, I don't think I ever saw him, but he was simply picked because he was there when Hungarian transports were delivered. And um, so what he did uh, when the transports arrived, uh, the people were removed from the cattle cars, the inmates, the other prisoners, they came and they had to empty all the cattle cars, put all these goods in piles in front of uh, the cars and the big trucks arrived and they loaded the goods and everything was taken to these barracks called Canada where everything was taken apart. The Nazis were determined to find everything that Jews brought with them. People would hide currency in the shoulder pads of their clothing when the hams or dresses, they would bake in a gold coin in a little Kaiser bun. And also after the people were gassed, um, they knocked out their gold crowns and fillings and the gold was um, uh, <clears throat> collected and they made bricks and Oscar Groening was carrying the loot in a metal suitcase to two or three times a week to Berlin. This is what he was saying. And uh, he was asked, did you ever receive a receipt for this? No. So you can imagine what went on in this terrible place. So uh, he was asked, did you ever take any money out of this? He says, no, never. Uh, so our lawyer, whose name is uh, Thomas Walter, he said, look, Years ago, you gave an interview to uh, the BBC and you said that you took some money out to buy a Luger pistol on the black market. He says, oh, he had the shum for guess and I forgot about that. But you know, he said that he simply followed orders, but he did say that all those people who say that uh, there was no gas chamber, they're a bunch of dolts. He says, I was there, I saw it. This is something he did say. He received four years. But you know, just the idea, there's something that he said in court. He was a very talkative person. You can picture this ramp, a transport arrived from Hungary, about 45 cattle cars, and you see 45 piles of goods on the ramp. He said, I had to patrol with a comrade, with another sergeant, before the goods were taken away. And these people were loading it on the inmates onto the trucks. He says, we had to watch them because they were crooks. They were stealing from the parcels. Can you imagine? To steal a piece of bread, a person who is starving was a terrible thing. But the gas shimmers were only two minutes away and the people were gas and that was okay. So um, he said a few other things he was asked. Did you had a chance to leave Auschwitz alive? He says, absolutely not. Some other things he said. So um, they both received four years. Um, they both died last year. They never served a day and they never served a day in jail. Um, <clears throat> so here I am in Mauthausen, Malk and Ebensee. I'm liberated in Ebensee on May the 6th, 1945. Mm -hmm. We were dying by the thousands. Weeks before liberation, I mean, we knew that I knew that the end was coming, but I also knew that they'd probably kill us all before they give up. So the typhus was killing us. I was in the lower bunk because I couldn't climb up into the middle bunk or the upper bunk. And um, somebody came uh, shuffling in and it's wooden clogs in this into a barrack and he kept mumbling away that um, the guards are no longer in the tower. And uh, I barely managed to get out, but something told me that I have to get out of this place. It was a place of death. There were people falling and dying on the floor, cadavers all over the place. I knew that if I don't get out of here, I'm, go I'm not going to make it. So I came out and in, in front of the barrack on the ground and I could hear some heavy equipment 
grinding up and uh, coming up the, towards the camp. And seconds later, the door came flying in, the gate. And there was a big thing coming through. It had a, uh, star, a white star on it. I knew it was an American tank. This was liberation. It was an amazing feeling to know that you are safe. But you know, your body sort of went flat. And I knew that here I'm, I'm okay. So, you know, we were liberated, but we were not free. It was a real battle for me to bring my body back. It took me over a year. You can imagine these were the lucky ones who were able to stand their skill, skin and bone. It took me a few months to uh, be able to get around. And in July, there was a loudspeaker and said that all those who are going to Czechoslovakia or Hungary, they have to be at the gate the next morning and 40 of us boarded a big army truck and we were dropped in Czechoslovakia and Česka Burejovica on a Sunday afternoon. <clears throat> so uh, I was in bad shape. Uh, I didn't know, I had pleurisy, wet pleurisy and my body was full of water and they had no clothing for us. So they found a big warehouse full of Hitler Youth shirts and uh, corduroy breeches. And we were all given Hitler Youth shirts and corduroy breeches. And this is how we arrived in Česka Burejovica in the square. And there's a band playing music. People are having beer and uh, uh, whatever, uh, sandwiches and uh, and this truck arrives and they look at these people and say a bunch of Hitler huge shirts. <laughs> and they said, what the heck? Uh, and then they realized, you know, that we don't look so good. And they brought us in and they took us off the truck and they gave us beer and food. And, you know, they gave us food and it was making me sicker and sicker. We're not able to keep food down, you know. So when they gave us, the irony of it was that we're dying from starvation. Now when they gave you food, it killed you. So it took me weeks to get back home. And um, I was hoping that my guardian dog Farkas would be there. I, I walked miles, I, farmers gave me a lift and I was a kilometer away from the home. I could see it from a distance and I, that home a year before was a very busy place. Three families, we had a, yard that was full of chickens and geese and ducks, a big orchard, and that's the house. And the fence is gone, the gate is gone. This is the lady Ili Klinka who uh, took care of the house after the war, because I was at the other end of the country and her little daughter. And I opened the door, my, this was my mother's kitchen on the front, the front these front two windows, the bedrooms. <clears throat> and the neighbor was sitting there, she didn't know who I was and uh, wouldn't give me a glass of water. So that was my home coming to Ch Slovakia. And I went to her home, Lake Klinka's home, and she just screamed out when she saw me. I mean, I saw her a year before and she did for me what my mother would have done. But I'd come back from a terrible trip and she managed to get a farmer with a team of horses the next day <clears throat> they took me 50 kilometers away to Košice. Uh, there was no train running or bus. And uh, I was there for a few months and uh, I wound up <clears throat> in an orphanage in uh, Marienbad outside Prague. And uh, I, I lived there for three years. And um, it took me three years to become a normal person, both physically and mentally. And um, then Czechoslovakia overnight was taken over by a communist putsch. This was in August or September of 49 uh, or 48, I think. We woke up in the morning, turned on the radio, and the announcement was that anybody who is 19 years old have to report right away, have to join the army or go to work in the coal mines. And there were about 35 of us kids orphans. I mean, we got to have to get the heck out of there. We grabbed our backpacks and tried to cross borders. And uh, I wound up after a lot of hardships in a DP camp in Austria, not far from Linz, where I was in camp. And I arrived in Canada in 1949, October the 25th. 
So, uh, uh, rather than Quebec City, um, got into the uh, terminal and um, I was given a cup of coffee and a sandwich and they, um, they put me on a train off to Toronto. And um, I remember I couldn't buy less than a dollar and change in my pocket. So the sandwich was gone right away, but um, we had the Jewish family in charge of this who uh, uh, helped us out and uh, my life started in this wonderful country. So uh, I just want to um, talk about what's on the next, uh, oh, oh yeah, here's uh, Rein Reinhold Hanning and Oscar Groening, yeah. I mean, so let me talk about anti-Semitism and the hatred of Jews and the BDS movement is well and alive here in Canada. So two years ago, uh, I had posters of my face besides synagogues. And obviously the poster says that the UGA, United Jewish Appeal, we make Holocaust education happen. So somebody called me on a Shabbat, on a Friday night, some uh, evil being crawled out from his hole and he painted Achtung on my face. I can tell you for anybody that went through the camps, the word Achtung brings back terrible memories because whenever you heard Achtung, you knew that something terrible was coming. So who could have been this person who did this in Toronto? So um, um, what can we do? How, what do we do? Uh, you know, hatred against Jews is growing by leaps and bounds. We are a tiny minority. I think we are about one and a half percent of the country's population. I know um, the Jews, uh, we contributors to the, to the country, both uh, economically and culturally. And, um, and I want to say that it starts with words. We must never forget how it starts. And you know, today you can see anything hateful hate against Jews in the papers and individuals, or uh, I keep telling in schools, kids what you can do. Uh, what happened to Jews was bullying on a massive scale on a government sponsored killing machine. It starts with words. Once you put out a terrible word, you can never take it back. Um, what's next? So here are, two little great-grandchildren, they live in Jerusalem. Uh, they are now older, next frame. So this is Yehudit. I, my little sister's name was Yudit. Her name is Yehudit. She's, she was bat mitzvah just now. So she, and this is Elisheva, she is something. She is 11 and this is Mikhail. He's going to be 10 and they live in Jerusalem. Uh, next. And this is my book, you all know you, everybody needs to read this book. And by the way, I have a website, it's a large website, and you can Google it by chancellor.com. You'll see a lot of things and uh, in this website. Next, please. Next. And so when I, my book was launched, I had a call from New York. Uh, he says, my name is Josh Eisen. He said, I read your book. He said, we are cousins. I said, really, how? I said, his grandfather and my grandfather were brothers. And he was in Toronto two days later with a family tree. So nobody told me as a child that my grandfather, six of his siblings in 19, early 1900, they uh, emigrated to the United States, four boys and two girls. So Josh's father is David. My grandfather's name was Rafael Fabian. So Josh said, I'm going to go back to Slovakia and see what I can find. And lo and behold, he went to a cemetery. Uh, I didn't know anything about my great grandfather. Uh, I said, go to my cemetery in my town. 
He said, I don't see anything here. So we, I said, go to another town, a village, nothing there. I said, go to the next village. And in this next village, there is a Christian cemetery and 15 stones were taken away from the Jewish cemetery because they put a soccer field over it. And they put 15 stones of the Jewish cemetery in a corner of this Christian cemetery. I mean, at least these were out, out there and there's a, a border, you know, and, um, and he said, this is it. Sri Yaakov, Jacob Eisen was his name. My uncle, Yenner, his Hebrew name is Sri Yaakov. So here is this, this is the only stone and marker that the Eisen family had anywhere. So a year later, we had a gathering in uh, Manhattan. 98 people came to this gathering. So um, Josh's aunt is 104 years old. <laughs> and um, so when we became Hungarians, they lived in Hungary. They had a winery in Tokai region. And I remember David Eisen, who was the youngest, came to see his elder brother, Fabian, my grandfather, in 1940. This is after we became Hungarians. Because, you know, we didn't go from Slovakia to Hungary or vice versa. And he came with two of his beautiful daughters. And uh, she remembers when I met her in Manhattan, she was 104 years old. And um, dinner was all set up in my room. And I wasn't found anywhere. I was with my friends sitting on a big long tree, you know. And he said, I, I got a real beating from my father. She remembered this. I said, well, so uh, isn't it amazing? Because most of the cemeteries in Europe, uh, stones are gone. Some are broken to bits and uh, sunk into the ground. It was truly something to find something, your roots that you were there. Next, please. <clears throat> so, Upstanders, if you can go back to this map of continental Europe, uh, Danielle. Okay, so picture this continental Europe. It was, um, occupied, collaborates, collaborators. Imagine thousands of locomotives hauling tens of thousands of cattle cars and their miserable human cargo from Rome, from Zagreb, from uh, Amsterdam, Rotterdam, Brussels, Berlin, Bratislava, Budapest, Bucharest, all the way to Saloniki in Greece. Millions of Jews are being hauled by train through central railway stations, railway tracks, and all these railway tracks lead to Auschwitz. So what was Europe doing? What were these people doing? Not a single rail track was sabotaged, you know, that was carrying Jews. People said they didn't know. I'm sure you could smell these trains when they were stopped sometimes at the railway station. These were not fast trains. The tracks were open for military traffic and, you know, these trains were standing at a siding, you know, sometimes for days without any food or water. So, um, People say, what can we do? I'll never forget this, Pastor Nimoy, who said, uh, he was in Berlin. When they came for the trade unionists, I didn't care. I wasn't a trade unionist. When they came for the communists, I didn't care. I wasn't a communist. When they came for the Jews, I didn't care. I wasn't a Jew. When they came for me, there was no one left to care. I think he died on a, in a cattle car on the way to Auschwitz. 
So kids ask me, I said, all you can do is look. You see bullying, you have to stand up and you say, you cannot do this in my school, in my city, in my town, in my country, we will not allow you to do this. It has to be a spontaneous reaction from everybody. People need to understand. It starts with the Jews. It does not end with the Jews. Haven't we learned from the past? If we don't, you know, I keep thinking of Winston Churchill. When Britain, during the battle for Britain, they were being blown apart by the Luftwaffe. He said that never in the history of the world was so much owed to so few by so many. These were the Spitfire pilots. And he said, no matter what we have to do, we must win this battle. If we don't, our way of life and our freedom will vanish into oblivion. And I think about Winston Churchill every single day today. And I think about Viktor Frankl every, every day. Imagine the wisdom that he had. He was a psychiatrist in Auschwitz. He was observing, I didn't know him, I was 15 and a half, he was a professional. In his book, Man's Search for Meaning, he said, he was studying who were the ones that survived. And you know, I use this theory today. You know, we are locked in, but I'm not in a camp. Those that had a why, they found a how. And I go by this, I remember this every single day. So, um, the last frame, back, Daniel. <clears throat> so, uh, I've been speaking to students in so many schools. A couple of years ago in Thunder Bay, I went to Thunder Bay for 19 years. Um, there was a professor who accommodated, um, who uh, brought, in, brought me in every single year in March or whenever the semester was finished, the students who were there the last year before they left the university. Uh, I spoke to his class of students and then he opened the auditorium at Lakehead University, brought in a thousand high school students. And then I, the, and the next day I spoke to two Catholic high schools, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. St. Ignatius, I think. And I gave my presentation and after the presentation, you know, you're sworn with students that they want pictures, they want to give you a hug or, and one, the 10th grader came up to me and he said, Mr. Eisen, um, I will promise you that I will stand on guard for Canada. So um, I think my message is that freedom is not free. And, um, you know, November 9th is a very important day that reminds us of the terrible things that started. And November 11 is a very important day, it's Remembrance Day. And um, how many young Canadians, you know, 15% of Canada's Jews, I think about 15,000 Jewish teenagers volunteered. It was before conscription in Canada to fight against the Nazis. And then once Canada got into the war, thousands of Canadians were loaded into ships. They crossed the treacherous waters of the Atlantic. They had to run the uh, U-boats to, um, and they took part in um, June the 4th to storm the beaches of Festung Europa. They called it Festung Europa. Fortress Europe, many died. 
they sacrifice their lives so we can have a free democratic country. When they see what's going on here today, I'm sure they're turning over in their graves. I feel that people that take, um, come to this country, you need to take care of this country. You need to uh, respect this country. You need to respect, respect, respect each other, no matter what religion or color you are. So to me, I will never forget this young man who said, Max, Mr. Eisen, I promise you, I will send a guard for Canada. So I think, well, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Okay, sounds good. Thank you so much, Max. Um, I know I was riveted to that. Uh, thank you so much for, for sharing that with us. And we do have quite a few questions that came through. Uh, one that, of course, you sort of touched on right at the end there. And it's a question from a viewer named Julie. And she basically said that, you know, you used to travel the world to share your story. Obviously, some days you would be in one city in the morning and somewhere else at night. And of course, COVID must have changed that in a lot of very significant ways. So do you have any words of wisdom for those that are struggling with the enormous changes that the pandemic has brought into Canada? Well, look, it's unfortunate. We have a situation and we need to deal with you deal. You play with the cards you're dealt with. You have to try to keep your life as normal as possible. You get up, you know, don't sleep until 10 o'clock because you can't go to work. You know, this is a routine that I have and I stick by this. The things that you must do, you must do and things that you need to do and things that you can do for somebody else. And, uh, you know, this shall pass too. It is not a camp. You know, in a camp, you didn't know what will happen to you from second to second. You know, we're fighting a pandemic. I call it a pandemic, actually. And um, we, we were used to good life. And, you know, it's very difficult, you know, when you're, li when you're living in a country where before you were free and you have, you're still living in the same situation, nothing has changed. But, you know, your movement is curtailed. It's a little more difficult and you have to be careful. And I know, Max, that recent, oh, not exactly recently, but a couple months ago, um, I know that I watched it and quite a few of our team members watched it, but you were on 60 Minutes, uh, featured for the USC Shoah Foundation hologram program. So, yeah. of course, that's out of Los Angeles, I believe. Yeah, um, so I was wondering if you could walk us through what that was like, because, of course, that's one of the more cutting edge uh, parts of Holocaust memory. So if you could tell us what that was like. Okay, uh, a hologram is, um, <clears throat> I was in um, Los Angeles for a whole week, and <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> and the Shoah Foundation, um, a person that came up with this idea, you are put into a tent sort of, and there are 36 cameras. And I had to wear an outfit, um, something from 60 years ago. And I had to wear the same outfit every single day for five days. And you are sitting there from nine to five and they ask you thousands of questions. And Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. So um, it was very difficult the first day. And uh, then you realize what this is all about. You know? So uh, it takes over a year to finish this uh, hologram. Mm -hmm. it, it costs uh, about $700,000. Somebody uh, donated the money and uh, I think it will be ready this coming year. I think it's very important. It's, I always say that we will be talking to you from the other side. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, a, it's like, a, the screen that I'm looking at, you know, it's on the wall, life size. And um, one of my colleagues from Toronto, who is a Holocaust survivor, he already has one. It's very eerie when I saw it the first time. You know, you realize that that will be it, you know, when we're not here. 
but uh, it's interesting to see. Um, and I think this will be it because look, I'm 92 and we were, I was one of the youngest, you know, as good as even younger than I by a year. I lost a few friends and uh, I can't get over it, you know, I really miss them. Um, and one in particular, Bill Gleed and I, they're very good friends. And, you know, I, I miss them when I need to talk, I go to the phone and I know that Bill isn't there. So this will be here forever. But, you know, polls are taken and the, the polls say that 50% of the people don't even know what Auschwitz was. And um, this should be a, a warning. It's a tool for people. You know, you need to, uh, some wise person said, without history, there is no memory. And without memory, there is no future. So for heaven's sakes, let's not repeat the same mistakes all over. We need to educate ourselves and see the light. Especially we, the Jewish community, we are very vulnerable. It has been so for 2000 years. <laughs> this is our lot. And um, here is little Israel. And this BDS movement is so virulent in universities. It's absolutely terrible. This little country is helping the world today. Can you imagine this little country of 8 million people? They are amongst the top five or maybe the top three of innovation countries in the world today. They are actually saving the world. They're teaching people how to grow food in areas. And they are increasing productivity in India for farmers. Imagine Jews are the best farmers in the world in medicine, in sciences, in whatever. And it's not a miracle that all of a sudden, many of these people who were such terrible enemies, they're lining up and they want to shake hands with uh, Israel. You know, in the UAE and the United Arab Emirates, they're learning Hebrew. I hear these people speaking about Israel you know, I, I, I cannot believe it. Isn't it an amazing thing? Well, and of course, we appreciate how often you work with us. I know in non-COVID times, you and I and Daniela and Elena and Jordan are traveling across the country uh, teaching about this. And, you know, of course, our uh, Tour for Humanity, we have hundreds of copies of your book on there that we give out, uh, you know, as far as Dryden, Winnipeg. So of course your story is is making it even across the country and beyond, uh, and of course we can see that with the number of people we have on this call today. Um, I'm going to turn the conversation over to Michael, our president and CEO, for a few closing remarks. Just being mindful of the time. Hi, Michael. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, Max, thank you so much. I I, I want to share with you that. I found your presentation today and I've seen you present before, um, but I found it very difficult because this past January was my first trip to Auschwitz and I walked up that rail track and seeing the picture flashing on my screen uh, of the images uh, just really brought it home. What you and Bill Gleed and Pinkus Guter and so many others um, faced and the fact that you're on this call the fact that you're here with us this afternoon, but, but I want to tell uh, um, all the people on this call something else, because I look at the list of people that are watching and listening, you, listening to you here today, and I recognize a lot of the names and their community members and people from beyond the community, uh, but they're, they're involved and they're active enough to know the importance of coming to hear your story. But I want to tell everybody that yesterday, I, uh, Max, on a, a Friends of Simon Wiesenthal Center program, spoke to over 3,000 students from the Regina Catholic and Public School Board uh, and from school officials out in Saskatoon. Over 3,000 students heard Max's story. Students, and in many cases, teachers who will never have heard such a thing. And I know most of us have. We've, we've heard the, the incredible 
inspirational stories of the the survivors that our community that are our community's most valuable resource but those children haven't those students haven't so max i just want to say to you and to all the other survivors that still make their voices loud and uh, you know loud and heard across the country and internationally thank you thank you for continuing to push because you're right we're facing a time of great challenge we're facing a time of rising anti-Semitism. We're facing it on campuses. We're facing it, uh, you know, when they come out on the streets to protest against the walk with Israel. We're facing it at the United Nations. We're facing it around the world. But hearing your story, hearing your story and that you never gave an inch, you never gave up, you never gave in. And the pride that you still have for your community, the Jewish people in the state of Israel, that that is a lesson we can all take and it can empower us to move forward from strength to strength. So Correct. Max, thank you.